Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. Welcome to the Live Tech Educator Podcast. Tonight, we're going to be talking all about school districts and how they make decisions for the technology that is determining what is used in the classroom. We recently had a caller um, meet us over on teachercast.net slash voicemail and ask the question, how does a school district make the decision to endorse a certain brand? Our guests today are from the Microsoft Corporation and also from school districts around the world. And we're going to be talking just about that subject. But first, I want to bring on our co-host tonight, Sam Patterson. Sam, how are you today? Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. Doing great. And I see you guys are doing some great things out there at your school district. How is that makerspace? It is humming along. We're getting ready for open house. We've got cardboard armor in full swing. Today we were using uh, Tinkercad to design connectors for our little Kiva building blocks. Very exciting stuff. The 3D printer was running. All the students were gathered around it, staring at the cooling plastic. That is pretty awesome. I've been seeing a lot of great stuff that you guys are doing over on the My Paperless Classroom Instagram feed. Now, a few weeks ago, Sam, we had some guests on and we were talking about what makes a school district take a, an identity to be like a Microsoft school and to be Office 365, go into the different Windows devices. I am looking forward to this conversation today. Are there any topics or questions that you would like to bring up and that you're interested in knowing? Because as a tech person, you and I are both kind of at the mercy of what the district decides, right? Yes and no. I've served on a number of different technology committees. I've actually been parts of some of these decisions. All I can say is I'm super excited about any show that claims to be able to demystify that process in <laughs> under an hour, because those committee meetings, they go on for years. <laughs> Well, in years. Well, we, in years. We, will, we will demystify this process in about 45 minutes for you. We'll make it even shorter. Of course, there are several great ways that you can reach out and be a part of this and all of the shows in the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network. We love it when you find us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And, of course, subscribe to this and all of our shows at TeacherCast.net slash iTunes and TeacherCast.net slash YouTube. My first guest is a fantastic educator and administrator from the Midwest. I want to bring on Mr. Rob Dixon. Rob, how are you today? Welcome to TeacherCast. Fantastic, guys. I just came from a uh, parent-teacher uh, meeting that was at uh, one of our turnaround schools where we just introduced a mobile learning unit. It's a uh, bus that we transformed into a flexible learning space. And so uh, we have like 15 surfaces on there. They do Minecraft and education. Uh, so we taught some parents what it looks like in a Minecraft world today. That sounds pretty awesome. You, you've got a bus full of Minecraft? <laughs> yeah. Like, how are you not at the White Castle drive through right now? Just like, <laughs> yo, I'm broadcasting live from the bus full of Minecraft. <laughs> so, uh, one thing we did identify is that the bus doesn't make it through a drive through very well. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Ah, uh, wow. That's okay. The kids will redesign it in Minecraft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also on our show today from the Microsoft education team, I want to bring on a good friend, Mr. Shannon Blankenship. Shannon, how are you today? Welcome to hey. TeacherCast. Thanks, Jeff. It's great to be here. Thank uh, you so for much those for those that I haven't met yet, hello. Uh, I'm Shannon Blankenship. I'm our classroom technologist, one of five in the country at Microsoft, former teacher and educator. Uh, and I'm all about, you know, how are the right classroom tools being used, uh, whether that's technology or not to drive student outcomes and learning, and more importantly, a love of learning. So thanks for having me on. Thank you guys for being here today. Let's just kind of get started here. I'm going to open up the questions and, and, and we'll have a great conversation here. When a school district makes a decision to officially adopt a major platform, and we're talking one of the big three here, but when we officially say we are going in this direction, talk to us about some of those decisions. I think many people think that it's just a new superintendent walks in, maybe points the finger and says, we're going in this direction and everything follows. Rob, is it that easy to do or is there much more that has to be under consideration? Um, so there's a lot more that needs to be under consideration. Uh, you know, I've made this decision twice in my previous district. 
um, we actually made the decision to move to Google Apps for Education sometime around 2009. And uh, the reasonings for that was that uh, really that layer of collaboration and, and saving dollars. Um, since then, since moving to Omaha and, and understanding our needs around uh, workflow and, and uh, you know, student data privacy, uh, the choice was really made around Office 365 just because of the enterprise features that was needed for uh, a school district this size. And, and talk to us a little bit about how long did it take to make those decisions? Was that a, a couple years rollout once the decision was made? Was it a no-brainer? How, how did all of that start once you uh, took the helm? So uh, we were one of the first districts in the uh, Fast Track program that uh, Microsoft had released. Uh, I arrived in May of 2014, and uh, we flipped over to Office 365 on October 20th of 2014. Um, so we made the decision fairly quickly. A lot of that was uh, a lot of consultation between our legal teams, uh, between our the needs that we had from our previous solution, which was an on-prem solution, very old solution that we'd had for uh, well over a decade. And so then we, we put those requirements together and uh, identified that you know, it was it was purposeful for us not to migrate that data, but to just um, really do a flash cut. So we just started anew, and so uh, that really allowed us to um, shift over fairly quickly. And then we used those fast track dollars to actually create collaboration spaces. So we we built SharePoint sites for every um, every school within the district at that point in time that uh, gave us. Uh, the collaboration that we needed uh, within the cloud. Now, if we were to look at the pie chart for these decisions here, I would assume that you have money. I would assume that you have students. I would assume that you have devices, and maybe you can over. You know, you can talk infrastructure, applications, that kinds of thing. What does that pie chart look like? How much of it is we're doing this for the students? We're doing this due to cost. We're doing this because it's easier. What What does that look like? So I tell you, our story at Omaha Public Schools is one that uh, allowed us to start fresh. So the district hadn't really looked at a planned obsolescence model for devices yet. Uh, there really wasn't a model for professional development. Um, there wasn't uh, you know, a focus of technology around uh, processes. So there were still a lot of people processes that were being done. And so when you look at those things, uh, how we addressed it was we needed an underlying foundation first for collaboration to happen. And that was a very basic form of collaboration. So looking at Outlook and Exchange, you know, uh, in the cloud and starting to migrate that experience into the cloud was important for us. So, you know, whenever we started down that pipe, um, we looked at professional development and how can we do that? And uh, thankfully there was the Microsoft Innovative Educator Program so we uh, started a cohort of about 200 Microsoft Innovative Educators that then gave us the professional development capabilities to uh, both onboard Office 365 because uh, it was important for us to give people the entire collaboration experience and not just deploy Outlook. So one of the main decisions that we had driving in was driving people to the Outlook web interface and not deploying the Outlook client just so that they would see all the features that were in Office 365 because the district hadn't adopted a collaboration platform before. You know, I love the fact that you're looking at this from all angles. I want to take that story of how a district is making these decisions and flip that story into how does it go? What is the process to actually create this stuff? Shannon, can you talk to us a little bit about the, yeah. the Microsoft side of this? I don't know if you're in any of these conversations or if you know sure. some of these stories, but when, when you guys are in the war room and you guys are putting together, we want to build these features. We want to redis, you know, like, what do those conversations look like? How do you guys do it from your end? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, you know, the vast, I have an opportunity to work with about a hundred different school districts at different capacities. And I go pretty deep 
across probably 20 to 25 of them and in, in, in basically 10 states in the west and um, i think the omaha story in terms of making that decision quickly can happen for sure uh, but i find jeff the most of the district it's a multi year process so at the, at the, at the baseline it's usually a full year and it's and it's really what i've come to find is it's really this sort of intersection i'm holding up a triangle that you can see here and it's just really this intersection i'm a visual guy of you know hey are the tools easy to use and do they foster all the you know five or six c's that we often talk about at the ISTE standards are they secure per rob's point right and then how does it align with the pedagogical focus, right? Like those are the often the frameworks as I talk to assistant superintendents and superintendents who then who are really strong leaders bring in teachers, right? Almost like a for, focus group um, to understand what is the problem and outcomes that we're driving and trying to solve. And so that's the first step is us really shutting up, coming in with that group of stakeholders and listening about what are those particular academic outcomes or pain points. Rob just talked about collaboration, right? And then thinking about, okay, given what you currently have, where are we gonna go place some bets, right? And so one of the most, one of the most common things I'd say, so from the Microsoft side, is we go away, we listen, we learn, we come back and we say, hey, here's what we heard you say. We heard you say you needed innovation in terms of collaboration. And a real pain point is you have to go and open multiple URL links in a class period. And that's a frustrating thing. What if we create an experience, particularly for younger teachers, where everything is integrated, right? Like Teams. Or, hey, I just was at a school yesterday. It's 99% free and reduced lunch, and 50% of the kids are new arrivals, English language learner students. What are we doing with my para professional budget who was just cut? How do I use some of the, the reading technology that you have built into OneNote to help support essentially uh, you know, a read aloud feature for kids, like real concrete tools? That's the stickiness that I see that we build those relationships with multiple layers of stakeholders. And then we go pilot. We say, hey, we know it's not a good thing in a school district of 80,000 kids to go out and try to push something out all at once. It can be done, absolutely. It depends on the culture of the district. But better yet, let's go pilot. Let's go build you know, the Microsoft Innovative Educators that are understand how the technology aligns to that triangle, right? I'm gonna keep coming back to that triangle, that idea of is it easy to use? Do I understand the pedagogical reasons to do so? Uh, and and how, the, how the security you know, piece of that works, particularly in public schools, right? So that's the motion we try before we really decide we wanna go do this. And many times it's multiple tools, right? Because at the end of the day, teachers just care about the outcomes and they wanna serve what's best for their kids. And so what I'm excited about is you mentioned all those things, budget issues, time, um, state state policy, uh, uh, gridlock. Yes, to all of the above. All of it is happening. And, and where I think we're showing up, particularly under Satya's leadership, our CEO, is to say, what's the value that we're going to add in the differentiation in the space? Um, and I could talk at length. And maybe, Rob, if you have you know insights of how you think about those things. But, I mean, there are multiple areas where I see us innovating and directly working with teachers uh, and administrators to build the product even before they've adopted our platform, mm -hmm. which is, I think, is a right. very I different mean, I, mode, I, I, you know. We've been able to participate in the development of teams since January uh, around mm -hmm. motioning classroom into that because we had worked with Microsoft Classroom before in modern groups. So uh, so that those 200 teachers have been involved in the, the product uh, creation of those uh, platforms and it's been interesting because I've never known Microsoft to have an interest in education like this. And so I think it was a, it, it was a good timing, I think, for both our district and I think for Microsoft, because uh, I don't know that, you know, the outcomes would have been the same, you know, five years ago or seven years ago, because, uh, you know, now, you know, we're we're teaching kids and 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 Microsoft is even focused around a whole strategy. So you're looking at, you know, bringing in data. We're, we're using Power BI to measure some behaviors right now and grabbing uh, grabbing information out of our student information system. We're using it for coaching uh, to display uh, pedagogical uh, uses within the classroom and being able to observe those things. Uh, you know, so all of those tools that are in that uh, suite 
are available for us to use for education. I don't know that we've put that emphasis in there before. And so it, it's been great for us that we built things that we probably wouldn't have built before, and but it's given a sing, single user experience. So the user, because they click on a tile, they still think it's within Office 365, even though there's several other products there. You know, one of the things that you guys had both picked up on is the way to train teachers, right? Once the decision is made, and I want to get back to some of these conversations here, mm -hmm. but I want to bring on another member of our family here on the Microsoft team. I want to bring on Frank. Frank, how are you today? Welcome to the show. Doing well. Thanks, Jeff. Talk to us a little bit about some of the stuff that you're working on. Recently, I noticed that the uh, Microsoft in Education YouTube channel has been quite popular, and you've been doing some pretty cool stuff in the professional development to get teachers interested and exciting. Talk to us a little bit about what Microsoft does to help aid school districts like Rob's, so that way the teachers can quickly, easily see those new features and learn how to implement them in the classrooms. Yeah, so we're really excited about Two, two things here. The, the pure rate in which we're able to bring new features from listening to teachers and listening to students and how they, uh, what they want from our products and how they use our products. Uh, we, as Shannon was talking about that, we're listening all the time and then saying, okay, what's the best way for them to change uh, or add a new feature that is really useful for teachers and, and students? So number one, I'm, I'm really excited about how fast we can get that innovation into the hands of, of students and teachers. But with that, you need that ability to really the product that they're using that's that's changing the good news is as in you know it used to be in years past that teachers and students would use a product from office and then three years later they'd get another product and they'd have to relearn that product just with a ton of new features but now what happens is these features just come at you in, in like a drip cycle a little bit each month they come at you um, and what we try to do is a couple of different things from within the product itself when you're actually using the product and you log on for the first time and there's a new feature available to you we want to let you know right then and there that that, hey, there's something new that you want to that you should be aware of. So, so for teachers that are using Teams or teachers that are using OneNote, will pop up a little message new with 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 OneNote, and here's the things, and you should try it out, or you can learn more. The other thing that we've been doing is trying to be really active in our social channels and online to, to help teachers understand what they can do with the product and how they can best use it. And so really, uh, that's what the concept of what's new in EDU is about, uh, all the little snack size uh, bits that we that we uh, we publish to say, hey, here's something new that you can like researcher is a great word. I did an example of that is like, hey, researcher is a great example of how you can keep kids focused and get them started quickly, really help them outline their idea and then get them into the creative process as quick as possible. Um, and so just being able to show teachers in something like what's in new in EDU or some other uh, format that we use to show them how they can use that feature to really help keeps, uh, keep keeps kids focused and engaged um, is one of the things that we try to do. Now, we had a, uh, for those of you who are listening, we had a little bit of some audio issues. All the links that Frank was mentioning, we're going to make sure that are in the show notes here. I, I definitely can't stress enough. Check out the What's New in EDU. You and Ari have done an absolutely, and, and the whole team there have done a great job. Sam, I want to come back to you. You said that you were in those meetings when you, your team is having these decisions and are being decision makers. Now, we've talked about what it takes to design the features. We've talked about what it takes to implement the features and what it takes to have these conversations. One of the things that Frank mentioned is the availability to know what's out there. And you and I have an opportunity to talk with companies large and small. What does it mean for you as a teacher to not only be able to learn those features, but learn them quickly and be a part of those decision-making uh, processes like with Rob and, and teams, of his, teams like his? Well, you know, as a teacher, you always want to be as aware as you can of what's going to be in the app when you open it next so that the instructions you give to the kids can be as succinct as possible. And at the same time, being able to have some voice in what shows up there can feel very empowering because, you know, other it's difficult to use a tool every day and have no real relationship with it other than you're just using this tool but if you have an opportunity to kind of give some feedback 
and this kind of thing, which is built into so many of these tools now, um, then you really feel like you're contributing something. So I have a question here that I, I want to throw it at our Microsoft friends, but I want to bring it to Rob first. Over here, I have a Surface book. And as a Surface expert, I've been able to really, really try out some of this great technology here. And I want to ask the chicken and egg question. So, Rob, when you're looking at deciding on what technology to purchase for your students and for your teachers, do you say, yep. what skills do I want? What devices can do that? Or do you say, hey, these are the Windows devices. Let's build the curriculum around that. And then I want to flip that question a little bit and ask Shannon something similar. So there were, it's really kind of twofold. So one, whenever we chose our teacher devices and we ended up going with Surface Pros for uh, all of our teachers at that time, uh, the need was around transforming the classroom. So um, A, we didn't have high density wireless at the time. Uh, that November, we had just passed the largest bond issue in Nebraska history at 421 million to help transform those classrooms. But without that wireless there um, i needed to be able to unhinge that teacher from that desk and so we went with wireless display adapters with surfaces a so that those teachers could walk around that room and facilitate learning rather than being cooped up uh, next to their teacher desk so that was a decision that was made because technologies allowed it to happen and those were requirements whenever we looked at student devices um, it took us a year to interview all 21 secondary schools that we rolled out devices to. And we came up with five different themes. And those themes were identified through those interviews. And uh, what we were asking schools initially was, what are the requirements that you need? What does your environment look like? What type of pedagogy do you want to go with? Um, if you know Omaha Public Schools, there's not a magnet theme we don't love. So, uh, you know, a one size fits all wasn't going to fit. So we came up with this theme model that we ended up going out to RFP for that was a non-traditional touch, a one-to-one -one low cost device. Um, it was a traditional laptop. We went with a high-end laptop and then we went with a small form factor desktop. Before the district had done a lot of desktops and we were moving to a mobile first, you know, cloud first environment. And so uh, we went with that model and ended up uh, executing an RFP that was about $8 million worth of devices in that first rung. And so when we looked at buildings, like I'm in Northwest right now uh, at a, a district citizens advisory, this building decided to go one-to-one. -one. It hadn't done that before. And so they went with uh, all Windows 10 devices. Uh, it was important for us for teachers to look at digital inking as well because uh, class notebook had just been released. We were looking at, um, making sure that teachers could give context to content. And I think that's an important thing to really identify for teachers, because when you look at the spaces that are in OneNote, there's not a lot of products that give that type of flexibility to have different artifacts that could be introduced into the same uh, platform and, and page and, and section to have the organization that's needed there. And so as we looked at that initially before even Microsoft Classroom was released and now Teams, uh, that really was a great platform for teachers to kind of deliver on. And it was important to find a device that met those needs. I, I love that answer as far as finding the device for the needs of your students on here. Shannon, let me let me throw the chicken and in the, in the egg question here. You've got applications that need the hardware but you've got the hardware that needs the applications to run it. So one of my questions that I've always been wanting to figure out is, what comes first, the Windows 10 feature or the Windows 10 computer? How is that built? But also when you're looking at the needs of the students, ver like what drives that? Because I would assume at some point in time, technology can't do something and we have to invent technology. But does yeah, your hardware well, team I'm say, I need Windows to do this because now we've reached... Talk to... I could, I could yeah. do this one for hours, but what is that conversation yeah. with everything? And Frank, if you want to join in on this, please do. Yeah. But I would love to know a little bit more about the whole what comes first. Well, I think I think just just to piggyback first on Rob's point about you know the device selection is one of the last decisions that you make in this process, right? It's a critical one 
for your question. But often I see schools that go and buy, for example, you talked about the Surface Book or even some of the other digital linking devices, but aren't clear about what is, what, why does digital link matter for the teaching and learning process and the creativity process. They don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. So I often tend to first back up and say, hey, let's be really clear about what's the type of teaching and learning environment and that pedagogy again that you're trying to, to drive um, and, and the benefits of touch and ink and an interactive um, device and feature. And I think there's a couple of things that I see happening today on the hardware side and the software side, right? And if you talk to our engineers, and by the way, every one of our product engineers is directly Skyping and or visiting teachers' classrooms on, on darn near a daily basis. I mean, Satya, as part of the shift, Jeff, really said, I want someone solely for education on the OneNote team, you know, talking to teachers and working with them exactly on the product features that you're talking about. Uh, and we sort of hear two things. There's sort of two core truths that we're hearing. One is, again, I'll get back to that triangle. What's the ease of use? What's the security? And how does it align with the teaching and learning? And I, Microsoft, I need you in your productivity suite with Office 365 and OneNote and Teams. I love the online version, but I also need that, that um, desktop app, right? Um, and because I've got kids that have various different, you know, situations. I've got some schools that have that connectivity and access. I've got others that don't. And so we're running really hard at both functionalities to both have a really powerful features in the browser. Um, you know, for example, in OneNote or in Teams, but then also within the desktop client that you'd see in Teams, as an example, there's just some things in there that teachers just saying, hey, I, I really need that offline access and that ability to collaborate in that space, which then drives, a dis you know, often a device discussion. So for teachers, it might be, gosh, you know, I really need um, a higher end device that has the capability to both run those offline applications that I need, uh, as well as some of the specific apps that I want, you know, that are out there um, that are popular, particularly in the, the STEM environment. Uh, and then on my on the student side, uh, you know, um, I might be able to get away with a lower, you know, spec device, a smaller processing power device. You know, we've got a number of devices now that are, uh, you know, lower priced in the sort of two to three hundred dollar range that are that's good enough right for those for those uh for those use cases and so you know from a hardware perspective we're really pushing hard based on what is that computing power that the user needs while simultaneously knowing that we're working with the app developer community as well as our own online clients um to bring that ease of use security and you know the pedagogical alignment and everything we do so um, that's the conversations that we're having day net net. What do I see in schools is, gosh, it'd be great to have a Surface Pro, you know, for teachers. So I could be untethered and I can move around the classroom. And I can have that offline access uh, and have that computing power. And then for students, you know, geez, um, you know, a, a, a primarily online based device with some local capabilities on the hard drive with touch and ink and something that's gonna last because I've got a very limited district budget, um, which then leads to you know the management of that, which I think is probably the uh, more Frank can talk about that, but that's a huge piece as well, is how do you go manage you know, those devices and that hardware um, given the demands on IT and the budgets. Well, Frank, let's talk about that because last year we met in New York and Microsoft rolled out a new way to manage devices and they rolled out Windows 10 S. Can you talk a little bit about some of those decisions? You know, again, as a school district is trying to choose which platform they want to go with, I would assume managing and rolling out is a huge decision, especially if you're listening to Rob's story here. Mm -hmm. Millions of devices all have to be managed at once. Frank, what can you tell us a little bit about this decision, maybe from the tech director's chair? Yeah, so there's a couple of things there too, not just Windows 10 S, but Intune for education as well. And I think I'll just touch a little bit again on what you and Shannon and Rob were talking about, the chicken and the egg. It's it's two things really. It's it's really listening to your customers and having those conversations. And as Shannon says, we're 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 talking to to teachers and IT guys every day to find out what their needs are and where their pain points are and how we can best uh, apply what we know about technology into those features. But then it's also it's like what do we know that we can bring to the classroom or to the school things like 
you know, uh, machine learning and intelligence to really improve uh, not only your uh, advanced threat protection to make your, your devices and your apps more secure because of machine learning and making sure that your data is safe, but there's that. But then there's also, what do we know about machine, or what can we take from machine learning to better understand the connections between people uh, and understand how they work together and how machine learning can help facilitate that and make that easier to connect. So, so all of these things intersect and come together in what we call innovation, right? Listening to what people are using and need in the classroom and then knowing what we know about technology and applying those things. So that's kind of what we did for Intune for Education and with Windows 10S. In listening to uh, 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 schools and IT and, and the, the pain they were going through in deploying devices, um, sometimes by the thousands at a time, what do they really need to be successful in that job? And then with, with Windows 10S, it really is about, hey, we heard you need more security, you need uh, the devices to be more streamlined, you need them to be simplified to really work well in the classroom. So combining that, that getting that from our customers and from teachers, you know, creating Windows 10S with all the power of Windows built in, but streamlined specifically for education. And then on top of that, the managing console with Intune for Education, which is really built on years of building out our product Intune and managing enterprise devices and making sure those devices are secure and safe and managed in, in a way that, uh, that the school wants to, but then hearing from our customers, hey, this really needs to be simplified. And then taking all the best parts of Intune and saying, okay, what really do you need to help them uh, roll out these devices and roll these devices quicker? And that's how we developed Intune for education. So it really is a combination of, of using technology with being a solution that really helps them achieve their goals in the school and in the classroom. Sam, a couple of weeks ago, you and I had a sh an opportunity to do a show on how teachers can work hand in hand with these companies. And here is a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a school district as large as Rob's. And I'm Rob, you got to talk to me about this one. 200 Microsoft Innovative Educators. What does it mean for your district to not only have a strong working relationship with these districts, but to have educators that are certified in the products that they're then professionally developing with their with their fellow coworkers? So it is important, you know, whenever you think about whenever you're dr trying to drive change, especially uh, change within the classroom, it's important to go through that gradual release cycle model, model shared, guided. And so when you look at that from a teacher's perspective, uh, you know, we had to invest um, a lot of professional development to see where our digital literacy levels are at. Because, you know, uh, our workforce is the largest it's ever been, you know, from a from a gap uh, standpoint of we have folks that don't retire nearly as uh, quickly as they used to. And we have folks coming in now. And so when you look at that gap in digital literacy, uh, it's important for us to bring that up as as we look at these products and and talk about the change that Jeffrey keeps talking about whenever we're looking at, you know, moving and and digitizing things within the classroom, but making experiences that are important for students. And so when, when you look at those things, it's important to have a representative in each uh, school to be able to drive that change. And so uh, we made sure that we had two individuals in each uh, school to be able to do that. And that was important for us because we didn't want mobility to happen from a year to year standpoint. We wanted some sustainability that would allow us to um, really incorporate collaboration within the platform. Uh, because I think the more you drive people to one place and to a common language, common language, whenever I talk about technology, uh, it shouldn't be something separate. Whenever we talk about curriculum, we talk about solutions, uh, all of those things sit in our single sign-on within that waffle. And so whenever you look at that, it's not something separate. Uh, whenever I teach it, it's about teaching and learning. It's not about technology. And so when you look at it from that standpoint, it's important to have those representatives within that, uh, each one of our schools. You know, quite, quite often, you know, in my role, I, I run K-12, I run six buildings, I'm constantly working with teachers and they ask the same question. Why doesn't my X software do this feature? And the one thing I will absolutely say about Microsoft and many of these uh, companies is 
Find them by email. Find them by Twitter. Find them out online. They are there to help out. They are there to help with these features. The MIE community is amazing. Sam, I want to bring you in here as a teacher. You have the opportunity now to not only talk to one, but two amazing Microsoft representatives who have direct results to what happens in the classroom. Is there one or two features out there that you as a teacher can say, I wish in the future my technology did this? Um, I think collaboration is an area where we could always use more sophisticated tools. And I know that teachers, what I would love to see is are two things. One, a platform that helps teachers teach collaboration skills. And two, a video template set up for instructive videos like lessons reflections etc what do you mean what, what would that look like well like you, you know there, there is an apple product that i open up and it asks me if i want to make a movie or a trailer and i'm like click on trailer it asks me for like a close-up and a medium view and a running away shot etc and it would have like that where you know asking the student what they did and suggesting what kinds of shots might help that just a a kind of fill in the blank template for an evidence of learning video or you know these kinds of things because when we look at what it's going to take to bridge this gap between our you know teachers who have grown up all of their life without tech and our students who have grown up all of their life with tech it's mm -hmm. some tools like this that teachers can look at and feel secure in the fact that they're giving enough support to all of their students are you asking for a kind of a digital, I'm going to call it a digital graphic organizer? It's like a Yeah, wizard, I mean, I, I make these, right? Yeah. I make them using slide decks and, mm -hmm. you know, right. just little fill-in-the-box things that I print out on paper. I talk to the kids a lot about storyboarding. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you look at the product that comes out, I mean, there's so many different platforms that have something like this. It's that, you know when i want kids to answer three questions i can say you know make me a video here's three slides mm -hmm. and a lot of them are still like well what do you want slides or a video i'm like no you're using the slides to guide your video making right, right. without trying to teach them the entire history of outlining right yep. you put a roman numeral here you know yeah, i don't, right. I don't. <laughs> really right. engage with those four c's you know when you're talking about creativity collaboration communication all those things tie into that storytelling Right. Well, let's, I'll tell you what, we've got a couple of things that I think get 80% there. Okay. Um, Story Remix is being released in the fall creators update of Windows 10 next week, actually. Yeah. That has a lot of what you're talking about, both blending uh, the real world and the augmented world, and the ability to narrate voice. Mm -hmm. uh, that then sits in an application that's going to be called Stream in uh, Office 365. However, that you know, that idea of having a, a wizard or a graphic organizer to kind of scaffold the adult is what I heard you say, not the student, right? Right. Scaffold right. the teacher. Like, actually, here's what I need. Um, uh, Jeff, if you could get our contact information afterward, I could probably get you connected to the guy who's building that product or and nice. gal um, yeah. and see if we can put that out there because I think it's a great idea. Um, and I think, you know, the, the Microsoft educator community attempts to – build some of those foundational skills this is a very this is a great ask but i think for the other teachers listening it's like how do i even get started i don't have 45 minutes to an hour to dedicate i have five minutes yeah. <laughs> because my toddler's sleeping still right. uh, what can i go learn that you know can start to build my toolkit that is one place you know i would encourage you to go visit there's a ton of content there i know um, Rob, you at Omaha have also used a lot of that um, but i think you know i've got those two things noted and i'll Let's let's talk. R let's Rob, talk with an engineer. Rob, same question for you. What 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 as an administrator are you sitting here saying? I wish my technology did. Now you had mentioned Power BI, which I recently did on a on a on a podcast. I think it's fantastic. What are you looking forward to um, out of your technology or for your students? You know, I think it's important for us to inform students and inform teachers in the way that uh, is important to them. I think. Um, Teams is a great step that way because you look at informal communication and, uh, you know, you look at email today, email is such a formalized, I mean, you do a subject, you have a, mm -hmm. you have a message, 
you've got a to and a from, and it's so formal. And when you look at teams, uh, it looks at that communication differently, uh, informally as, as students communicate. I think as we grow more and more into that realm, it's important for us to make sure that, uh, you know, our teachers understand how to operate in that uh, environment. And so, you know, I think professional development is a big key piece. And, you know, that was part of the reason why, so professional learning communities and modern groups was driven out of, we had started a turnaround program, the first turnaround program in Nebraska, we replaced all the teachers, but three and the principal in that school. And those PLCs were developed in OneNote and created as templates to be placed in modern groups out of that need. And so I think, you know, for me, it's how do we place content from Mech into Office 365 so that I can begin to badge a teacher and understand uh, the capacities of a person. And so whenever I look at people inside of, of Office 365, I want to now start seeing what is the, what is the capacity of that person? You know, what does that look like? is that person have knowledge in this or that? And and then it brings value to both a student and a teacher to have that enabled in their environment. And so the more we start talking about badging and micro-credentials and all those things, I think it helps us to define what people, you know, who people are and their individualized, uh, uh, their strengths that they have. And so I think that's important. As you're out there listening to this show and you have questions, comments, suggestions, please feel free to reach out to us. Feedback at teachercast.net or you can always leave a voice message over at teachercast.net slash voicemail. I'd love to, to hear your, your thoughts and comments on this and I can certainly help get you guys connected with Shannon and Frank here. Um, Shannon and Frank, I, I know there's some things that we can't talk about yet that are kind of NDA, but it seems to me very clearly that we're now moving into the world of augmented reality. Um, the iPhones, all AR now. I, I've been beta testing the Story Remix all summer. I love it. I'm looking forward to seeing what students Good. can do with it. I, I, I've been making videos of my kids running around the school, or running around our house here, and then you're having like dinosaurs and stuff walking into them. <laughs> awesome. I, I've, been, I've been sending Ari and, and, and Lindsay and everybody on the team here some pretty cool videos of like these monsters attacking my kids. It's been really fun. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about what is on the horizon here? I mean, I know like beyond the AR, clearly there's stuff that's a year out that you guys are like, wait till we have this keynote. What What is coming? What is the next big hurdle for, for devices, for technology? How far out are companies such as Microsoft building? And what is what does that look like? Well, I think, Shannon, if I could just take the first stab at this sure. uh, and just say, you know, w without getting into anything specific, I, I think you could see a lot of the things that we're already that we're already doing um, with virtual reality, augmented reality and the HoloLens uh, and things like that. And then how we're incorporating 3D into things like PowerPoint and 3D paint so that you can actually create those 3D objects and then insert them into your PowerPoint or insert them into your into your HoloLens. So so you're already seeing seeing a lot of things that you can do today and where we're going. And I just see in the future more and more of that becoming more practical, um, being more available to schools and being able to incorporate that into your everyday tools like we're already using it, like like PowerPoint, like you're seeing that with, with Paint 3D and how we can just build those exciting um, new ways to visualize data into the tools that we're already using. So, so without getting into anything too specific, and I don't know a lot of day where the future is going when it comes to augmented reality and things like that. All right, China, yeah. it's up to you. Can you spill the beans? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, t I'll share one thing boring and one thing maybe a little bit forward looking. I mean, what, one thing boring, but I think matters, particularly for the teachers listening tonight, is that it's not about being a Microsoft district or an Apple district or an Amazon district or a Google district, right? Like what we're seeing in real time today, and I think over the next six to 12 months, is what are the teaching and learning outcomes I'm driving toward and what are the best tools available that are out there? Rob's talked about Teams and OneNote and some of the key things around literacy with immersive reader and artificial intelligence, right? But like, how do I set that environment up 
in my district of 70,000 kids, right, and maybe 5,000, 6,000 staff, how do I set up multiple access to tools to empower my teachers to choose the tool, right, that's best for them? And I think that that's something I really want to make sure. It's kind of a boring concept, but it's the thing I hear from teachers so much. It's like, I just want to use the best possible tool to reach my kids. How do I facilitate that? So for the teachers, the IT pros listening, we're doing that today, right? We have the capabilities to set that up. Um, and it's a yes and, not a yes but, or a yeah, or either or, right? Um, but so I think that's there from the technological side. So if you're hearing, hey, we can't run this, or we can only choose one, baloney. I, I can point you to districts that are doing multi, using multiple tools. Uh, the question around security is a different bag, but in terms of ease of use and pedagogy, lots of great stuff out there. Uh, the second thing I think that I would share um, that I see kind of moving forward is really the use of intelligent bots. So whether it's Cortana or Siri or you know whoever, um, I envision in a world and I'm seeing stuff now in the labs at Microsoft where we're, we're testing how these smart agents can actually be used in the classroom, right? So instead of asking, you know, uh, your, your administrative, you know, your paraprofessional or someone else to go do, you know, some remedial task for you. You're literally t asking, you know, Cortana to go, you know, pull up a series of websites or prepare the class because you've got 52 minutes to get the class started. Like those, that infusion of what you see in the consumer space with artificial intelligence and smart assistants, I see that as kind of a, the next big piece where you're going to see us lead, I hope. I think our, our engineering team is laser focused on that um, and is talking to teachers right now about what might be those scenarios where we could actually add value the same way, you know, your, your Cortana or Alexa today supports you in your consumer life, right? Guys, I want to say... Know, I could give you a great example of that today. I mean... Uh, I have Cortana uh, hooked up to Power BI and I can ask her how many coaching visits were uh, done today. And so if you can do that with student information for a teacher in the future and just say, you know, uh, you know, everybody's in attendance, but Jimmy's gone today and that automatically happens. The one thing you're you always ask a teacher, what the, what do they wish they had more of in its time? If you can create those efficiencies to where you can ask that, I think that brings great value. I think today has been an absolutely fantastic conversation, and I wish we had time to go longer. I would love to invite you guys to come back on the show to continue this conversation, um, but we are coming up here on the end. Guys, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time out and, and sharing these stories, sharing these, these, these conversations with us. Rob, where do we go to learn more about the great work that you're doing and also all the amazing things that are happening in your school district? Sure, you can go to transformation.ops.org and it has a lot of uh, uh, activities that we've done uh, to get to where we're at, so. Excellent, and uh, what's your Twitter address, sir? Uh, at show me Rob, I'm from Missouri, so show me state. Excellent, we'll certainly have all the links to that. Frank, where do we learn more about what's going on with you and your part of uh, Microsoft? And again, how do we find that YouTube channel? Yeah, I think you just go to um, Microsoft.com WAC Education, and then you can uh, you can see all the cool things that we've got for education uh, available to your schools. And then on YouTube, you just just go there and, and type in what's new in EDU, and you'll find us. Excellent. And uh, and Shannon, yeah. where do we learn more about what you're yeah, doing? Yeah, I'm going to tell the teacher audience: you guys don't have time to go look at a website unless you really want to. Uh, it's there in, and it's right, the WAC education site, but go to what's new in EDU. You've got 90 seconds, you got two minutes, you wanna go explore something further, maybe go check out the website. Um, I would encourage you really uh, to to check out, you know, Jeff, to, to bookend today's conversation. How are these decisions being made in my district and what's a potential process? We've got what we call the transformation net framework. Right, that's available. That Frank's talked about it. What's new in EDU, and it's also on the Microsoft.com WAC Education site. So, if you go to those two spots, you'll be up to date on all the new, you know, features. Uh, and more importantly, you know, follow us. Follow our Twitter handles at, at Microsoft EDU, and also um, uh, uh, our Facebook page. Right, you're gonna you're gonna 
stay up to date and come to a local event. We've got tons of local events that are hosted by those MIE experts, uh, those Microsoft Innovative Educators across the country, and then of course all the different ISTE affiliate events, especially if you're new to this space. There's there's plenty of opportunities to connect face-to-face -face with our educators. I, I always say the best place to learn about this stuff is to attend some of these conferences. ISTE this mm -hmm. year is going to be in Chicago. It is Fantastic. the spot to learn from hundreds of mm -hmm. teachers of all different school districts. Check that stuff out. We want to learn from you. What is up with your school district and how are you making these decisions you can of course find us on twitter at teachercast leave us a voice message over at teachercast.net slash voicemail email us over at teacher at feedback at teachercast.net and of course subscribe to this and all of our shows at teachercast.net slash itunes and teachercast.net slash youtube on behalf of everybody here in the teachercast educational broadcasting network my name is jeff bradbury reminding you to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students